Bless the Lord Jesus. Amen. I want to greet you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Lord, our King, our God. Amen. Indeed, He is worthy to be praised. You know, last week we started a Bible study on the topic, the oneness of God. We were talking about contending for the faith. And we looked at the oneness of God from a historical perspective. Amen. We look at the fact that when the church started in the first century, Amen. Which came out of uh, Judaism type of theology. Amen. The church believed in one God. Amen. And we realized that there was a development of the Trinity over a period of time. Amen. Till about 381, we had the Council of Constantinople where it was uh, fully developed. Amen. Our aim tonight is, is, is last week we gave you a historical ride, practically a historical story in terms of how this doctrine that we are. Uh, have to be contained against came about and tonight we're going to go back to what the Bible actually teaches in relation to God you know the Bible says in the book of Hebrew that he that commit to God must believe that he is and that is a reward to them that diligently seek him amen so our aim tonight is to look at the the topic the oneness of God we're going to be contending for the faith amen I will be looking at the, the one of the core tenets amen of the apostolic church that we believe that there is one god one numerical one amen not one in unison not 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 any other form of one that they place out there we believe that there is only one god amen but um tonight i pray god that we will be blessed by the topic amen and that we will learn something there's a whole heap of stuff that we need to cover tonight amen and i pray god that we will have our notebook and we will make our notes Amen. As we go through this subject tonight, bow your heads as we pray. Great God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you again for another opportunity to break bread. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we are here in your presence. You say where two or three are gathered together, touching anything concerning you, you're in the midst to grant and to bless. God, I pray God that you'll give me clarity of thought tonight. And I pray God that you'll help me that whatever I speak, whatever I say, Hallelujah. We'll give you glory and honor and praise. And that somebody will benefit, eh, God, from the, 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 the Bible study tonight. I pray, God, that you'll help us, God. Help me, oh God, as I rightly divide your word of truth. And I pray, God, that at the end of this session, that we will come to an acknowledgement that Jesus is the one and through, true God of the scriptures. Thank you, God, for what you have done and for what you're about to do. In the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus Christ, I pray tonight. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. Let us just go to uh, the slides. Amen. Now, as we look at the topic, amen, there are two verses that we're going to be using as our key text. Firstly, we'll be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. We looked at that last week. Amen. But we'll add one more to it. So there's a verse in the Old Testament which speaks about God, and there's a verse in the New Testament that speaks about God. So, in the Old Testament, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Amen. We spoke about this last week, so I won't go back over it, but we know it's the Shema. Amen. And this is what the Jews say in the morning and in the night. Amen. This is what the Jews, this is the core tenet, amen, of Judaism. Amen. They believe that there is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Amen. Now look at in the New Testament where Paul was writing to the church at Colossians, at Colossae. Amen. And he writes in the book of Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. I mean, at the end of the session tonight, our objective is that you should be able to understand oneness of God in the Old Testament. You're going to realize that we did not come up with the concept that there is one God. But even before there was a New Testament, even before the church came into being, amen, um, the, 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 from God calling Abraham, amen, we realized that there was a concept that he is one. We're going to look at that. 
you're going to look at the names and the titles of God, you're going to realize that there is something about the name of Jesus that gives us a revelation about who he is. Amen. I want to realize that even from the Old Testament, God would have used names in a powerful way. So we're going to look at some names and some titles of God, and we're going to link that right back to who Jesus is. And then we're going to look at the last point we're going to look at is the fact that Jesus is God. Amen. So we're jumping from the Old Testament and we're going to the New Testament where we're going to close out where scriptures will tell us that Jesus is God. Amen. And, and while we are going along this journey, amen, our aim is to look at certain things that have even new converts, people who have been in church are a bit uh confused in a sense in, in terms of how do i explain some of these things and we're going to make some stop at certain places amen and try to explain some things so that if we are confronted amen for the doctrine if somebody comes to us and want to ask us questions in relation to what we believe we should be able to give them an answer from scripture praise god now one of the things we must understand is that if god is a trinity according to what the Trinitarians say, then they're saying that we should find it on the pages of the Old Testament. Um, so if God is a Trinity, then I assume then that in the Old Testament we should see Trinity being brought out. Amen. And, and, and God would not have held that from, from, from humanity for such a long time. All this time, the Jews knew that he was one. And then all of a sudden, there's a new revelation that there's not one, there's three. Amen. But if God is one, starting from the Old Testament, we should see clearly, amen, that a trinity exists. However, what we realize is that in the Old Testament passages, amen, the, the doctrine of the trinity, amen, is never, never taught. The passages explicitly enunciate the Trinitarian doctrine. However, it, our no Old Testament passage explicitly enunciates the Trinitarian doctrine. And what we realize is that what we find in the Old Testament, especially in books like Isaiah, is an, aff an affirmation of strict monotheism. What we see is clearly in Scripture is that God truly is one. Amen. And we're going to look at a few verses that speak about the oneness of God in the Old Testament. You know, we want to be looking at verses tonight. Amen. And as we look at these verses, we've got to look at what the Bible actually say about God in the Old Testament. So, for example, in 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 22, it says, Wherefore, Amen, thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee according to all that we have heard with our ears amen now what you're going to realize is that all the verses that we're going to be looking at the verses that we're going to be looking at they use what is called in the english language a reflex pronoun and what that is is that the subject and the object of the sentence are the same so the person who is speaking in some cases is the same, it's talking about himself. It's called a reflexive uh, pronoun. So, for example, there are many cases where reflexive pronouns are used. But we're going to talk about that as we go along and what they are. But let's just look at some other verses. For example, Psalm chapter 86 and verse 10. It says, For thou art great and dost wondrous things, thou art God alone my god let's look at some other verses isaiah chapter 43 verse 10 to 11 that one says ye are my witnesses saith the lord and what i'm doing i'm not even trying to explain anything yet i'm just showing you you can see a process a preeminence that's been set up throughout the old testament ye are my witnesses saith the lord and note the word lord is in capital l-o-r-d and my servant whom i have chosen that he may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me was there no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. Amen. Look at Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6. It says, 
Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So we see, some, we see, we see some things coming out through these passages. Look at Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 6. It says, That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. All right, let's just come out to Isaiah and go to Malachi chapter 2. Amen. And verse 10. So we, 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 we're looking at some verses, Malachi chapter 2 and verse 10. We're looking at some verses in the Old Testament, and there are many that I'll probably skip over, but you'll see them, I can make note of them. It says, have ye not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we, and he goes on to deal with some other issues. Look at, look at another one, Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 9. It says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, my God, shall there be one Lord and his name one. So we, we, we're seeing over and over through those verses that God truly is one. I made re make mention of uh, a reflexive pronoun being used. So for example, in, in the scripture that we read in Psalms 86.10, I don't know if we look at that, it says, For thou art great and dost wondrous things, thou art God alone. And in that verse, the reflexive pronoun we see is the word alone. It's, it's, it, and it's, it's what it is used to emphasize that God is the only one and there's no other God that, that exists. Amen. You can look at another one, Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6. I just want to show you what, what is happening. Thus said the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first. And I am the last, and that sounds familiar to me, but we're going, we're going to go there. So I'm saying, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. In this verse, the reflexive pronoun is beside me, that word beside me. And it's used to emphasize that there is no other God beside the Lord. Amen. So, what we're going to realize is that over and over the Bible keep on emphasizing that there is truly one God. And, the, and, and we are seeing this all the way through the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, we must make note of the fact, must make note of the fact that God is always called the Holy One. Over and over through Scripture, we see where the Bible refers to him as the Holy One. So we keep on seeing this term once. We're in Bible study. So let's look at some of these verses. First of all, Isaiah, Psalm chapter 71 and verse 22. It says, I will also praise thee with the psaltery, even thy truth, O my God. Unto thee will I sing with the harp, O thou holy one of Israel. As, um, Psalm 78 verse 41, he says, Yea, they turned back and tempted me and limited the Holy One of Israel. Look at one more. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 24. He said, Therefore, and, 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 and I skipped out some of the verses because I just want, I just want to make the point that what the Bible is teaching us. Therefore, as the fire devour the stubble and the flame consume the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. So what we keep on seeing, brethren, is that there tend to be an emphasis on the fact that there is only one. The Old Testament keep on showing us that there is one God. 
But what we find is that people would find reasons to say, okay, we, we do see it speaks to Holy One. We do see where it emphasizes that there's only one God and there's none beside me. I even I am the Lord and beside me there's no Savior. So on and so on. Amen. So the Trinitarians look at this and they say, let us look at some things that they say, where they say that they see the Trinity in the Old Testament. And let us try to look at some of these things to see if it really makes uh, logical sense. So they have cited allusions to the Trinity in the Old Testament. The first one they said, they said the use of the plural word Elohim suggests that there is a Trinity. Now, what we have to do is not, it, there is a fact, it is a fact that Elohim is a plural word. It is a fact. But a plurality of what is important. And we're going to try to look at that. They say, okay, we see a divine plural in the phrase, let us make man in our image, according to Genesis 1.26. We're going to look at that also right now. And we're going to try to see what the scriptures actually mean in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And then they conclude now from these two things that uh, the passages that would speak to a monotheistic type of God, amen, what it really is reflecting to them is agreement and a unity among the Trinity. Amen. So, having look at Elohim according to them, which is a plural word, and let us make man in our own image, amen, they say, look here, every time we see when the Bible talk about the Holy One or I am by myself, it's really an agreement, amen, among the Trinity. But let us try to examine their logic. And we're going to first look at the term Elohim. Now, Elohim in the Old Testament is what is often used for God. In, uh, the, the word that is used for God is, in many cases in the Old Testament, is the word Elohim. The first time that we see the word Elohim in the scripture is in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And we know that verse. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That word God there is the word Elohim. So in the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. Now in the Old Testament, the word Elohim is found about 2,602 times. Um, and when I say the Old Testament, I might use the word Tenach. The Tenach is practically is the, the, the Hebrew word. It is a combination of the three parts that make up the Old Testament from the, from the Hebrew perspective. So the Tenak it speaks to the Torah, the ne Nevim, and the Ketuvim, which is practically the law, the prophets, and the writings. That's how they separate their, the Old Testament into three parts. So when we talk about the Tanak or the Tenak, depending on how you pronounce it, it, mean, it refers to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, the word Elohim is used 2,602 times. Now, of the 2,602 times, 250 times, Elohim is not used for God. I want you to take note of that. Elohim, lowercase e, is sometimes used in reference to false gods. So false gods are also called Elohim. <laughs> false God also speaks to uh, uh, angels. Human leaders are called Elohim. Judges are called Elohim. But in relation to God, they normally use uppercase e, Elohim, right? But the point I'm trying to make is that Elohim is not just in reference to the God of the Old Testament, but our false gods were also called Elohim. Supernatural spirits like angels were also called Elohim. Human leaders were called, because it's just a word, Elohim is just a word uh, that describes something about God, right? Or describes something about who they're speaking about. Now, let us look at the word Elohim. Elohim is the plural form of the word Eloah. And it means God. So if you say Elohim, or you say Eloah, it mean Eloah is the singular form of the word Elohim. And then you have the, what is called the abbreviated 
singular and the abbreviated singular is, is just a short or a simplified form of the word. Amen. They also find the word L. And, it, and the word L means might. It means strength. It means power. Very important point. So Elohim is the plural form of the word Eloha. And sometimes they might use the abbreviated singular. And so instead of saying Eloha, they must simply say L. And L is simply a shortened or a simplified form of the word. Now, here what Trinitarians argue. They argue that the word Elohim is used for God in the plural sense and signifies a plurality of persons in the Godhead. In other words, in their saying, because it's plural, it's a plurality of persons in the Godhead. But saints of the Most High God, is this really a true statement? And in order for us to understand this, we're going to take a closer look into what Elohim is. And why that statement kind of would throw you off. If we look at the word, if the word speaks to a plurality of persons, how do we answer some of the following questions? Number one, there are many other Hebrew words that have plural form, but they have a singular undertone. So for example, the word mayim is for water. The word misraim is for Egypt. Uh, Jerusalem is for Jerusalem. Now, can I answer the question now? Based on the fact that these words are plural words, and they all they are plural words, but they all denote a singular undertone. How do I know that? I know that there's only one Jerusalem. I know that there's only one Egypt. And when we speak about water, who pluralizes water? It, 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 so, even though the word itself is a plural word, when you see the him on it, amen, it does not necessarily speak to plurality of personalities or anything in that regard. Now, here comes an a even stronger point. If Elohim of the Jews was a trinity of three persons, what about the Elohim of the Gentile nations. I did mention earlier that false deities were also called Elohim. So if you look in Judges chapter 16 and verse 23, it says, And the Lord of the Philistines, is there on the screen, gathered them together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their lowercase god. That word God there, if you look at it in the... Uh, Hebrew language which was written that word God there would be Elohim and they rejoiced for they said our God locus God Elohim had delivered Samson our enemy in our hands then you have the next verse and it came to pass in 2nd Kings chapter 19 27 as he was worshiping the house of Nishrach his God again we see the word Elohim as a matter of fact, if we go further, the Israelites used the word Elohim for the golden calf that they made and they worship in the wilderness. So Exodus chapter 32 and verse 1 says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Let us make gods which shall go up before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought up brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And verse 34, And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graven tool, after he had made it into a molding calf. And they said, These be the thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, can I tell you something? The scriptures, even though the word Elohim is used, it is a clear fact that they only created one golden calf. So when we think about Elohim then, remember our definition of El, El speaks to might, El speaks to, to strength. Eloha is, 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 the, is the bigger version of El, 
but Elohim is the plural version of Eloah and El. So when we say Elohim, it is not correct to say that it speaks to a plurality of persons because even though it's a plural word, it does not speak to persons. El is might. El is strength. So when we say Elohim, we are talking about plurality that denotes plentitude of might. In other words, when we say that God is Elohim, what we are saying that God is not just a mighty God. We are saying that he is almighty God. Amen. He is the mighty one, the almighty one. And the Hebrew Bible consistently presents monotheism and uses uh, Elohim to denote no, no Hebrew person, when they speak of Elohim, spoke of, in their mind, had a concept of a trinity. Every Hebrew person, when they use the term Elohim, they use it in its rightful sense. Elohim speaks to a plurality of might. And, 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 and I, I can challenge any Hebrew person, any scholar, any person, to show me where Elohim has anything in its definition that can relate unto persons. In it, it speaks to a plurality of might. So when you say God is Elohim, you're saying that he is the almighty God. That doesn't change any of the other verses that declare him to be one. Then the verse going to let us make man. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Amen. And, 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 and it can be explained in several ways. One. From a Jewish perspective, the Bible says in Job chapter 38, verse 47, and we can probably look at that one. The Jews say that when the verse says, let us make man, from the Jews' perspective, and you can ask any Orthodox Jew, they say that in their mind, the us there is making reference to the angels. That's what they say. Notice they did not say it's in reference to any other second person in the Trinity. That's very important too because the truth be told, they never saw any other person in the Godhead but one God. So from their mind, they say that God was just simply conversing with the angels. That's one of the, the points that they bring across. So Job chapter 38 and verse 47 says, When was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who had laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Or who had stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundation thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? It says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. In other words, the morning star is that term that is used for the angels. So he's saying that God was conversed. And this is, talk, this is God talking with Job and saying, where were you when I was laying the foundation of the earth? Where were you when I was doing this? I was doing that. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where were you? In other words, man wasn't even created yet. Amen. So this term is in reference to the angels. Praise God. Another viewpoint on Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 by some christian theologians one theologians is that he counseled with his own will praise god so if you look at ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11 it says in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will so everything that was done was done after the counsel of his he does he works everything amen so when the bible says let us he does all things he works everything after the counsel of his own will he not a body as we talk with so he must be talk with himself all right but there is another way to look at it the plural pronouns simply agree with the plural noun Elohim. And what do I mean by that? In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. So the, there's a, a pronoun us and there's a possessive pronoun our. So 
the use of the pronoun us and the possessive pronoun our indicates a plural subject probably but the most common understanding among the subject is that this is an example of a majestic or a literal plural amen in other words in the ancient near eastern culture they want to convey an idea of royalty or high status so they use the plural form so the speaker or the writer is emphasizing the importance of the greatness of the subject my god so for example in genesis chapter 1 verse 26 that we just read a while ago the use of the plural form is a way of emphasizing the majesty and the greatness of god as the creator of all things it was never intended to indicate that there are multiple of persons in the Godhead or that God is speaking to another divine being. So we find through scriptures a, a continuous use of what is called the majesty or literary pronoun through scripture. So for example, Daniel chapter 2 and verse 26. This is a dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. That is a majesty or a literal plural because it was Daniel who was about to tell what he was about to say, but he used we. Amen. Ezra chapter 4 verse 18. The letter which he sent unto us had been plainly read before me. Amen. The letter which you sent unto us, talking about to the king, but in other words, again we see majesty, but he was talking about one king. Amen. Ezra chapter uh, 7 and verse 3. I make a decree. That all they of the people of Israel and of the, his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. Amen. And in verse 7, verse 24, also we, we certify you. And this is the one king talking about himself. But he used the majesty or literal plural, plural to talk about himself. So, and I will see that a lot of time also where, where, where government officials will talk that way. We. But sometimes he's making reference to himself. The, the queen, we, or the king, we. But they're making reference to themselves. So, the prophetic, another reason for uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, in terms of the use of us, is some scholars say it's, it's in reference to a future manifestation of the Son of God. So, in other words, God said, let us, he was, remember that God does not sit in the realm of time. God sits in the realm of eternity. So he, Jesus was the Lamb of God before the foundation of the earth. So in other words, some theologians say God was looking down the corridors of time and addressing a prophetic utterance to the Son. Because remember that God is a spirit. Amen. He did not have flesh and blood. But only way flesh and blood come in, this, in, in, in the picture is through Jesus Christ. So while Jesus was there at the beginning, in our mind, we exist in time. So we, we would have only been at that place. But in the mind of God, he existed all through eternity. And therefore, it is believed that he was speaking to the human form that would have come 4,000 years later. So we must note, however, that even though the verses let us make man in our own image, to show that it's really one God. Verse 27 brought it back down to the singular. It says, uh, And God made man in his own image. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God created he, in male and female created he, them. So verse 26 use us, but verse, verse 26 use us, but verse 27 brought it back down to a singular. Uh, that is needed. Amen. So we must note, however, that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, his and he are all singular, whereas the personal pronouns in Genesis chapter 26, us and our, are all plural. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, only one individual is actually doing the creating. And who is that one individual? God. So, and God created man in his own image. Now, they argue then about some monotheistic passages talking about a plurality of persons and, 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 and is a unity. 
So they, they, they say in verses where we see it talking about one, it's, it's, it's really a combination of, 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 of beings combined together, working together in unison. But let's look at what the Bible says. So many Trinitarians would often cite verses that uses one, and they're saying that their explanation for this is that uh, it's an agreement and a harmony between the gods or, or the, the different persons that make up the Godhead. Amen. And they cite, for example, when we say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. They say that the word one there is a one in unison. Amen. And they, they, but let's just look at it. The word one there is the Hebrew word ekad, ekad. And let's just try to look at what ekad actually means. Now, Trinitarians point out that the Hebrew word used to describe God, oneness, is ekad. And we, 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 we agree on that. The, the, the word that is used to talk about God being one is the word ekad. Amen. And the word ekad can mean one, it really can mean one agreement, an absolute numerical oneness. Amen. So, if, for example, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, we have seen where it talks about male and female uh, become one flesh. In that case, you talk about a one in unison. But, however, what we realize is that what is consistent throughout Scripture is that in all other cases where the word one is used, it's always in reference to a numerical one. Amen. So, for example, uh, we can look at some examples where Eckhart is also used and is in reference to a numerical one. So, a list of Canaanite kings, each designated by the word Ekad, is found in Joshua chapter 12, verse 9 to 24. Amen. So it said, the king of Jericho, one. The king of Ai, which is beside Bethel, one. The king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king, and they keep on going down. Every time the word one there is used, is the word Ekad. And all scholars will tell you that this is a numerical one. Same word, Ekad. Then we find the prophet Micah in 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 8. Amen. And he also uses the word uh, Echad. So he says, And the Lord of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. That word there, one man, one, is Echad. And we know that this is one man, one prophet, that the king did not like. Amen. Then we see Abraham in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 34. Amen. We see the word Echad again. It says, So the son of man, they had inherited those wastes of the land of Israel. Speak, saying, Abraham was one. So this is Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 24. Amen. It says, Son of man, they have inhabited those wastes of the land of Israel. Speak, saying, Abraham was one. And he inherited the land, but we are many. The land is given us for inheritance. Amen. That word, one, as used in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 24, is the word Echad. Again, it's numerical one. Then we see in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 31 to 34. And I guess we can, we can probably stop. We don't have to put up that one. But Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. Let's look at that one. We're talking about the angel Michael. Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. It says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which stood me one and twenty days that word one again is the hebrew word ekad and it means numerical one why do i bring out all of this in each of the above cases ekad means numerical one what we are seeing is a consistent use of the word ekad and we are seeing it being used throughout scripture 
to refer to a numerical one. Why is that important? Again, in the mind of the Jew, when they say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, the word echad in their mind speaks to strict monotheism. So they are seeing God as an absolute one. Now, if echad does not mean one in number, then what defense do we have against polytheism? Because if there is more than one God in the Godhead, amen, then where there can be a separation of gods. Our separate gods could be one in unity of the mind and purpose. That's true, but we really don't have an argument against polytheism. And no wonder you cannot say Trinitarianism is oneness. The two don't go together. If Eckhart in the Old Testament did not speak to a numerical one, then as I said before, we have no defense against polytheism because three or more separate gods could be one unity of mind and purpose. If Eckhart connotes a unity of plural things, it signifies the unity of God's multiple attributes. So if we're going to talk about it being a unity of something, it cannot be a unison of persons. Like in the case of Genesis, where you talk about the, 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 the man and woman become one, if it's used in any plural form like that, it cannot be a plurality of persons or things. It must be a plurality of attributes, the attributes that God has. But what is consistent throughout the Old Testament, and I just pull a few examples, is where Echad is used, and in all the examples, it was used in reference to one. Now, that we just touch the surface in relation to some of the Hebrew words. So we're going to jump now to the name of God. We're going to build out some more things. Because we're looking at the oneness of God from different viewpoints. We're defending the Godhead. We're defending the oneness of God. We are contending for the faith. Now it's very important that we understand the significance of names in the Bible. It's not like today where people are just given names. And, and, and should be told, people have some very weird names and, and, and they really don't spend the time to find out what some of these names mean. But in the Bible, when people were given names, they carried a lot of significance. They carried a lot of meaning. And a lot of times, the names that were given to people would reveal something about the character, would reveal something about the history, would reveal something about the nature of the individual. So, for example, we find that there are many places where God himself would have to change people's names based on where he was taking them. So, Abraham was changed to Abraham. Abraham means exalted father. But Abraham means father of a multitude. So, God changed his name based on where God was taking him. Jacob, and we talk about this all the time, means heel catcher it means supplanter and when god dealt with him god changed his name to israel meaning a prince with god meaning he rules with god amen a ruler with god or he will rule as god so this 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 we find that the names were very significant in scripture and, 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 and God ensured that that was there because the, the name of God was also significant. What you're going to realize is that the name of God denotes four things that really about him throughout the Old Testament. One, the name of God speaks to his character. So in Exodus chapter 6 verse 2 to 7, it says, And God spake unto Moses, saying, Better yet, and God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians kept in bondage. And I remembered my covenant. Wherefore says the other children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from the 
under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will rid you out of their bondage and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with a great judgment and I will take you to me for a people and I will be unto you a God and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God which bring you out of from under the burdens of the Egyptians notice it says he keep on emphasizing over and over that I am the Lord that do these things. I am the, and there's a reason for that because he was saying that he was linking his character with who he is, his name. So his name spoke to his character. He speak to, I am the Lord, I am Jehovah. So I was not known to them by the name Jehovah, but now uh, this is the name I'm known to you by. And why? Because I have done this and I have done that. It speaks to his character. The name of God also speaks to his power. So Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16 says, And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power and that in my name may be declared throughout all the earth. So his name was synonymous with his power. I have done this. I've raised you up. I've shown you my power so that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. And, and we, we see that some names, when you call certain names, even in society, we, we clearly hear it's associated with some form of human power. Amen. Um, power in some realm or some power in politics, power in government, power in, and it goes on and on. But Jesus is saying, when you, I've done this to you, I've shown you my power so that my name amen, may be declared throughout all the earth. The name of God also speaks to his authority. And, and, and I want you to make note of these four things because you can realize that as we get a revelation of who Jesus is, you're going to realize there is something that, that is similar. The name of God speaks to his authority. Exodus chapter 22, 23, verse 20 to 21. It says, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Authority. Authority. The angel spoke to his authority. And then the last thing spoke to his presence. In, amen. So when they were building the tabernacle, amen, in X in first Kings, it talk about but will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold the name and the heaven of heavens cannot the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built, that then eyes might be opened towards this house night and day, even toward the place which thou hast set, my name shall be there, that thou mayest hearten. So it's talking about the fact that the name of God is where his presence is. Wherever his name is mentioned, his presence is also going to be there. Now let us look at some Old Testament name for God. And we're going to build up to show you what is happening in relation to Jesus. So in the Old Testament, we say God is called by certain names and titles. He's called by God. And we, we talk about that. Elohim, El, strength, might, almighty, deity. Then you have Elohim, which is the plural form of El, uh, denoting intensity, denotes al the Almighty God. And the most, I would say, is the most common Hebrew word that is used for God in the Old Testament. We said that earlier. Then there is the word Lord. The word Lord in the Old Testament, you have Lord, that is Adon, which is a local ruler or master. Amen. So, a, so Sarah call her husband, Lord and master. That's the word Adon, which speaks to a ruler, a master. But there's the word Adonai, which is emphatic form, and it's always referred to God. If I, if I am the Lord, and beside me there's no Savior. There's Adonai, amen. Capital L, common O-R-D. Then there's also in the, in the Bible, you might see the word capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Now, when you see that in your Bible, that is not Adonai. Amen. That is referring to the, the, the name of God. That is Yahweh. Amen. The, what is called the Tetragrammaton. Amen. So Y-H-W-H is derived from the verb to be. And it's related to the I am. So Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 where Jesus appeared to Abraham and uh, to, to Moses. And he says uh, to Moses that I am that I am. 
am. Amen. And in, in that verse, amen, it is talking about um, that is the capital use of L O R D. If it was supposed to be translated, it would have been Yahweh, it would have been Jehovah. Amen. And that verse means I am, it means to, to be. It connotes the self existing one. You talk about the eternal one. Amen. So every time you see the word L O R D, capital all, we know it's specifically talking about God Almighty, talking about Jehovah God. It is the unique name by which God identifies himself in the Old Testament. Amen. So unlike all the other names that were called, when we see um, YHWH or capital L-O-R-D, because that's how the translators translate it. The King James Version will always have capital L-O-R-D. If you look in the Hebrew text, you will see you will probably see um, YHWH, right? Because that's how they try to pronounce it. So that's another name and a title for God. I want you to make note of that. Another name is the word Elroy, Elroy which means God of sight. I have El Shaddai, which is Almighty God. And it, it goes on and on. So there are many names that God was called by. Amen? But the, 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 the ones I wanted to emphasize is the capital L-O-R-D, which is the, is the term Jehovah. Always in reference to Jehovah, the Tetragrammaton. And, and you know, the funny thing about that, that YHWH is very powerful because it has meaning. We're going to talk about that quickly. But in addition to the name of God, there's what is called the compound name of God. What that is, every time God would do something in the Old Testament, they would attach to the YHWH something that he has done. Amen. And they would call him by that name. So there is the same one God. It's not like when you see Jehovah Jireh and Jehovah Nisi is two different gods. It's the same Jehovah, but it's a compound name for God. In other words, they have attached something to bring out an attribute of God. So, you see, he's called Jehovah Jireh in Genesis chapter 22, 14. And that means the Lord that provides. So, and Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh as it's said to this day in the mouth of the Lord. And he had seen it. So, God provided a ram in the ticket. Amen. And when, when, when Moses realized the ram was, was, was provided, he called God Jehovah Jireh. They have Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord that heals. Exodus chapter 15, 26. And said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I brought upon the Egypt. So for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Amen. Jehovah Rapha. Amen. He's also called Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner, or the Lord our victory. He must be victorious because a banner is like a flag. And anyway, a flag is risen. Whoever uh, is in the country that is, that, 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 for example, the U.S. Embassy, they raise the U.S. flag at the U.S. Embassy to show that the U.S. is in charge there. So any crime that takes place on the U.S. Embassy, the U.S. is in charge of that because the U.S. flag has been raised there. So they realize that whenever they would raise the flag of God, amen, that God is in charge there. Exodus chapter 17, 15, talk about that Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. The Lord, my banner. The Lord, my victory. Amen. They have Jehovah Makadesh, which means the Lord that sanctifies. They have Jehovah Shalom, which is the Lord or peace. They have Jehovah Raha, the Lord, my shepherd. They have Jehovah Shamoth, the Lord of hosts. Amen. I have Jehovah Elion, the Lord most high. But I want you to notice that each of these names does give us a different, a progressive revelation about God. Each of them give us a different viewpoint of the one God. Amen. But there had to be a name that was, that, 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 that was, that had to be used in heaven and earth. Amen. Because, I mean, all of these names were like, they were names of God, but they, 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 they really didn't reveal the fullness of what God wanted to do with humanity. So as I said before, we find that the Old Testament, God progressively revealed more and more about himself. And he did this through self-revelation. He did this through revealing about himself and giving names to himself as he goes along. But the question was still asked by people of old, what is your name? With all the revelation, and Pastor made allude to this uh, two Sundays ago, what really is your name? Amen. So none of the Old Testament 
gave a complete revelation of God's nature. Even though they were there, and he was called Jehovah Jireh, and he was called Jehovah Nisi, and he was called Jehovah Raha, none of these names give a full, wholesome revelation of God. So Old Testament saints realize this, and they, even though they say, okay, we know him as Jehovah Rapha, we know him as Jehovah Nisi, amen, they know that this time there was more to be expressed. And that, that is why as they spoke with him, they would keep on asking him this question. For example, the Bible said Jacob wrestled with God at Peniel. And look at the question he was asking God in Genesis chapter 32, verse 29. Let's look at that one. And Jacob asked God, Exodus, Genesis chapter 32 and verse 29. Genesis chapter 32 and verse 29. <clears throat> it says, and Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Whereof is it that thou asks after my name? And he blessed him thereof. No, said God, his name was not revealed there. Amen. Jacob wanted to know the name, but the name, the theophany of God, did not reveal the name to him. Then we find Manoah, the father of Samson. He asked the angel of the Lord, L O R D, what was his name? Amen. And look what the Bible says in Judges chapter 13, verse 18. It says, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou this after my name, seeing it is a secret? In other words, the name God, and, and this is how God deals with us, brethren. I always tell you, there's a principle called the principle of progressive revelation, where God progressively reveals himself to us. When you become a child of God, is over time you begin to learn more and more about God. And God has been doing this all through scripture. Amen. The name that he was going to use. Amen. The name which is going to be above all other names. The name where heaven and earth is named. The name where angels bow before was not revealed. It was a secret. Why are you asking me my name? And then we see the prophet Agar in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4. In a prophetic statement, he said, Who had ascended up into heaven? Who had gathered the winds in his fist? Who had bound the waters in a garment? Who had established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name if thou canst tell there was a name to be revealed now can i tell you something when the fullness of time came the bible gave us that name matthew 1 verse 21 better yet if you look at isaiah chapter 52 and verse 6 it says therefore my people shall know my name so all the time god is telling that there's going to come a time where the people of the name is going to know his name. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. Who is I? Matthew 1, 21. It says in Matthew 1 and verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son. Matthew 1 and verse 21. Amen. It says, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, my God, for he shall save his people from their sins. Let's look at it again. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. My God. So when the fullness of time came, God revealed himself in an all and all his power and all his glory through a name, the name Jesus. How do I know that? Remember, you know, every time in the Old Testament where God did something, he would, he would attach to the name Jehovah the attribute of what he was about to do. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nishi, Jehovah Makadesh, Jehovah Raha, Amen, Jehovah Jireh, Amen. But here it is that we find the name Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus, brethren, is a combination of two words. The name Jesus actually means Jehovah Savior. 
It means Jehovah our salvation. It means Jehovah is salvation. So Jesus really is the culmination of all the Old Testament names of God. That's what Jesus is. So how do I know that? Everything that was revealed about God is revealed in Jesus. It incorporates everything the Old Testament reveals about God. How do I know that? Matthew 1, 21, we'll just look at that one. It says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. But look at Matthew 1, 23. It says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. So here it is that Matthew 1, 21 told you the name. But it linked it to who it was of the Old Testament. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. My God. So Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only one who actually personifies and fulfills that name. How we do that? Remember I said earlier, the name of God in the Old Testament reveals four things about him. It reveals its character. It reveals its power. It reveals his authority and it reveals his presence. Look at the name Jesus. The name of Jesus reveals four things about Jesus. It reveals Jesus' character. It reveals Jesus' power. It reveals Jesus' authority. And it reveals God's presence. Just like the, the name of the Old Testament would, would do. You know why? Because Jesus is really the God of the Old Testament. So Colossians 2 verse 9 says, For in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It reveals the character, the full body character of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. It reveals also his power. Look at John 14, 14. It says, If you shall ask anything in my name, what name is that? Jesus, I will do it. You know why? That is why when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus denotes his power. Amen. And, 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 and Acts 3, 16 says, Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You know why? He said it, he never said in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He never said in the name of, he said in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus, it takes the power, the power of God. It also speaks to the authority of God. Amen. So Matthew 28, 18 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power. That word power there is the word authority. Amen. It's, it's, the, it's the Greek word that speaks to authority. Amen. All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And it's interesting that he said it's all authority because if he has all authority what is left for the other persons of the trinity but you know why why it, 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 this was not a contradiction and was not a problem because jesus is the god of the old testament and therefore he has all authority in heaven and in earth amen john 5 43 says i am come in my father's name speaks to authority amen and he received me not if another shall come in his own name he sh him he shall receive but guess what? The name of Jesus also speaks to his presence. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together, touching anything or in my name. Let me not forget that. Where two or three are gathered together in my name. What name is that? Jesus. I am in the midst of them. And you know the funny thing about it? Jesus was linking, remember when I, when, I, when I quoted the scripture earlier, when they were building the, the temple, Jehovah said, where my name is placed, my presence is going to be there. And Jesus is saying, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I will going to be in the midst. You know what, two of them said the same thing? Because it's really the same person. Amen. So when we say Jesus on a Sunday morning, Jesus shows up, the presence of God is in the place. Now, there's something about the name of Jesus that makes it different than all the other names that we have mentioned before. First of all, the name of Jesus is the highest name. My God. Acts chapter 4 and verse 10. Be it known unto you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you hold. Acts 
chapter 4 and verse 12 now says, Amen, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name, no other name, no matter what you want to think, no other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. You know why? Because it is the highest name. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 21 says something. It says, far above all principalities and powers and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the one that is to come. You know why the name of Jesus is so exalted? Because the name of Jesus is the, is, is the fulfillment of all the attributes of God that were being progressively revealed over time. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 to 11. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, hallelujah, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when we say the name of Jesus, it's not a magical formula. We have to have faith in Jesus himself. Amen. So the Bible talks about Acts chapter 3 verse 16 and his name, so faith in his name had made this man whole. Acts chapter 10 verse 43, to give him all the prophet's witness that through his Name whereof we also believe in him shall receive a man remission of sins. So the scriptures clearly tell us that there is something about the name of Jesus. The early church preached, the early church taught, the early church prayed, the early church performed miracles, the early church healed sick. They cast out demons. The early church baptized. The early church suffered. The early church rejoiced. And guess what? They all do all of this in one name. The name of Jesus. I love the name of Jesus. Now, more revelation about the name of God. Let's look at some more revelation and in relation to the name of God. Now, earlier, I made reference to when we say capital L-O-R-D. We say it represents what is known as the Tetragrammaton. Remember I said that earlier. We mentioned that L-O-R-D speaks to uh, the name Jehovah. And we say that Jesus is Jehovah, salvation. Amen. But I want us to take a closer look. Even from the Old Testament time, God, even though it was a secret, God was putting us in our face. So when God says, my name is Jehovah, it expressed the combination of these letters, YH, WH, which represents the name of God, even to Moses at the burning bush. He said, I am that I am. But let us look at the letters that make up the YH, WH. Now, it sounds something like this. yod he wa he And it's rendered as Yahweh. Now, it has what is called an ideographic meaning. What an ideographic is, is, is where a picture or a symbol represents an idea, represents a concept, something that you want to bring across. So one, a good example of an a ideogram is, for example, when you go to the bathroom, and you go somewhere, especially in malls or so, airports, wherever. And you want to know if they don't have the word male or female on the door. They have a male or a female shaped sign. And this is what is called an ideogram. Because whenever we see that sign, we know it represents that this is supposed to be the bathroom for the male. And this is supposed to be the bathroom for the female. Even so, what we get to understand is that each letter of the Hebrew language, or each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, sorry, represents a symbol and it carries a meaning. So let me go back again. So you have, you have Yod He Wah He, 
all of these have a symbol associated with it and those symbols have a meaning associated with it um, so let's look at the table of the hebrew alphabet so you have for example aleph which is an ox a strength a leader you have beth which is a house amen um you have so on and so forth let tell a couple of them that jump out you have none seed fish you have um shin eat consume destroy you have tav which marks sign covenant but each of these things represent something you see look for yod yod means hand arm Heh, H-E-H, or H-E-Y in some cases, means behold, or behold thee. And where and vav, they actually means nail. So vav, nail, or peg. So when we see the name Jehovah from the Old Testament, yod he wow eh, it means hand, behold, nail. So from the Old Testament time, when you put it together like that, it speaks like this, behold the hand, behold the nail. What was happening here? We're from the Old Testament time, God was revealing that he would have died on the cross. When Thomas went to him, he said, look at my hand, the nail prints in my hand. But that again is showing you that he, Jesus, is the fulfillment of the name that God was revealing to the people from the Old Testament. When we said Jehovah, we are saying yod he wah he in Hebrew, which practically is saying hand, behold, nail, which practically is saying behold the hand, Behold the nail, my God. So from the Old Testament time, God was revealing himself straight. That who he is, he is the person that is going to come and die on the cross. Let's take it a little further. Look at the name Jesus. The name Jesus is the Hebrew word Yeshua. Yeshua means Yahweh is salvation. But look at it. When you put Yeshua. Together, you get Yod Shin Va Ayin. Yod means represent the idea of creating or making. Shin means consuming or destroying. Vav means adding or secure, which means to save. And Avin means knowing or experiencing. When you put it together, the name Yeshua, based on the, the ideographic meaning of the symbols, means the, the one who creates, the one who destroys. The one who secures and the one who knows and wishes you to experience or to know him. That's so like Jesus though. Because he creates, who created all things? God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When you say Jesus, you're saying that you are the one that created. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. I can't say um, John chapter 1. But he's not also the one who creates. He's also the one who destroys. Amen. And he's the one who secures or the one who saves. So he will come and save us. And then not only that, he does only save you. He wants you to experience him. I mean, he wants you to know him or to experience him. So even in the name Yeshua, which means Yahweh is our salvation, we are seeing clearly that he is the one who is God of the Old Testament. So the name of Jesus is the highest, most exalted name ever re revealed to humanity. Philippians 2, 9, Wherefore God give my name which is above every name. Amen. It is the name of Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. It says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord. This case is one Adonai. And his name one. Echad. Numerical. 
The Bible foretold that the Messiah would declare the name of the Lord. Look at Psalms 22, verse 22. It says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. His name is going to be declared. And link that back now to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12. It says, saying, and this was talking about Jesus. So the psalmist was talking about Jehovah, but no, the writer of the Hebrew is linking the psalm to Jesus. It says, saying, I will declare thy name unto the brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. My God. So what, they have, what the psalmist in his mind, from a Jewish mind, was talking about the one God of the Old Testament. And the writer of the Hebrew is now saying, you know, understand, the name that is supposed to be revealed is Jesus, and he revealed it in the church. And why is this so? Because in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Let's jump to the last topic. Jesus is God. Now, in the Old Testament, we see a couple of verses where it specifically spoke about give some teaching in relation to God. So Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Then Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Then in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, it says, Behold thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. That is a ruler in Israel, whose going forth is from of old, from everlasting. But when you link that verse in uh, Isaiah chapter 35, verse 46, we see that there is something about Jesus that is different. Because we're going now to the fact that Jesus is God. Look at Isaiah chapter 35 verse 46 first. And then Luke chapter 7 and verse 22. Isaiah chapter 35 verse 46 says, They say to them, Thou art of a fearful heart. Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with recompense. He will come and save you. Verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Verse 6. Then said the lame man, leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dung sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and the stream in the desert. No, I want you to make note of everything that was being said a while ago about God of the Old Testament. And look what it said now about Jesus in Luke chapter 7, verse 22. Now, there was an issue where John wanted to confirm who Jesus was. And Jesus said, go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. How the blind see, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor, the gospel is preached. Something is linking Jesus to the God of the Old Testament. So we must interpret the New Testament in the light of the Old Testament. In terms of the context, in terms of the culture. The original writers of, uh, of the Old Testament never had a trinity. As a matter of fact, I said before, I, 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 I deliberately started with the fact that the writers of the uh, New Testament, the, the whole concept of the Trinity, was never developed until 400 years after the first century church. So in the minds of the first century writers, in the mind of the Old Testament people, they had a concept of strict 
monotheism. Amen. They had a concept of strip monotheism. So when the writers called Jesus Lord and God, they were using the same meaning that was being used in the Old Testament. That is why, as you came to the second century, they couldn't reconcile it. Because should be told to understand who Jesus is come with revelation. When you understand that Jesus is really the God manifest in flesh, if you get this revelation, brethren, you are blessed. Because a lot of people out there don't even get it because of this corrupt doctrine. So there are a couple of verses that teach us that Jesus was absolute deity. For example, in Colossians chapter 2, let's just start from verse 8 and verse and then, and, and then, and then 8, 9, and 10. So Colossians chapter 2, starting verse, verse 8. It says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, and why I started there, because I wanted to show you who they were talking about. Not after Christ. For in him, making reference to the, who they were talking about in the previous verse, which is Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. Now the truth be told, you know, go back to verse 9. The fact that he used all fullness and godhead in english this is a redundant it's a re really a redundant it's an overkill but the apostle wanted to ensure you get it because all means fullness and godhead speaks to everything that makes god god so you could have said in him dwelleth the godhead bodily you could have said in him dwelleth all the Godhead bodily. But the, the apostle wanted to emphasize who Jesus was. In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead body. So if you use three words, that means the same thing. All the fullness of the Godhead. Everything. He is like, he wants to make sure that you don't miss the point. In Jesus Christ, and the question is sometimes asked, is Jesus in the Godhead? Or is the Godhead in Jesus? The Trinity would say that Jesus is in the Godhead. In other words, he's a part of what makes the Godhead the Godhead. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible said the Godhead is in Jesus, which means that all the fullness, everything that makes God God, the full fulfillment of God, is revealed in Jesus. For in him, Jesus, well, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, other passages teach that Jesus is really God incarnate. Amen. So, for example, I'm going to look at a few of them. And you don't have to bring them up. I'll just quote them. In John chapter 20, verse 28 to 31, the Bible says, And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. My God. It shows you in the mind of Thomas, he was not thinking from an Old Testament he was not thinking from a trinity and perspective. He was clearly a Jew who now got the revelation of who Jesus is. And he says, my Lord and my God. Acts 20, 28. Take heed unto thyself and to the flock over which the Holy Spirit had made thee overseers. And feed. Show this one. Acts chapter 20, 28. Because I want to highlight a point. The Bible clearly tells in St. John 4, 24 that God is a spirit. The Bible also says a spirit don't have flesh and blood. <laughs> but look at this scripture. Acts chapter 20 verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit had made you overseer. To feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. At what point did, Jesus, when did God have blood? When he manifested himself into flesh. The humanity of Jesus is practically what the blood, where the blood exists. And that's the only point in time 
we would say that God, I put God in quotes, has blood because God is a spirit. But because the apostles, in the apostles' mind, they knew that Jesus, even though he was human, he was also God. They could say he freed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. My God. And there are many verses that reveal that Jesus is God incarnate. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 19, he says to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Colossians 1, 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Amen. Colossians 1, 19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. My God. Titus 2, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearance of the great God, and our Savior Jesus Christ. And somebody might say, why the word and there is used? The word and there is the Greek word kai, kai, K A I, which actually can be rendered even. So if you should use it as the meaning of kai, it could really look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearance of the great God, even our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, J Jesus is the Word made flesh. Old Testament meaning of the word, the Hebrew word is dabar, and it means God speaking. But in the New Testament, we find the word logos, right? So in the Old Testament, sometimes you see the word word is dabar, and it talks to the fact that God is speaking. In the New Testament, it's the word logos, and it's an unsprex word, the thought, the reason, the plan. It's, it's ex our express word, a speech or an action. So, St. John 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning was the word, the logos, the, the, the thought, the reason, the plan. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And that word with there, we're going to talk about that because Trinity always says, see it, it was with God. But when, when, what you have to go back again to the, 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 the Greek to understand what with mean. But he reconciled it and said the word was God. And guess what? If the word was God, what happened to the word? Verse 14. And the word, St. John 1, 14, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, the Father full of grace and truth. Amen. So we see where the word, the plan, the thought, the reason of God was with God. And it was God and the thought that God had put on flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. We said before, we're not going to leave it like that because we want to look at the word with. Because a lot of changes we say, see, with. The word was with God. The word is God's mind, thought, reason, plan, which is God himself. The word was with God. That word with there means pertaining to. It doesn't mean that he was with him as beside him. It means it pertains to God. So in the beginning was the word. The word, was, the word pertains to God, but the word was God. So the word is also God's self-revelation, God's self-disclosure, God's uttering himself. The word is the eternal word of God himself. And that is what became flesh as the son. So the flesh is the son amen but the word was inside him the bible talk about the eternal word but it never made mention of the eternal son because the son had a beginning and the son also has an ending but in relation to the word the word is forever settled in heaven the incarnation occurred at christ's uh, conception so jesus was at god's conception look at Mac malachi Micah chapter 5 verse 2, where the prophecy was made that behold Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands, amen, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth me, come forth unto me. That's the rule in Israel, who is going forth is from old, from everlasting. Then it links back to Matthew 1 23. Now, the same term, Emmanuel, was used. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us.
Then Luke chapter 135, and the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So Jesus was at God's conception. Jesus was God at conception. And we notice this because there are a couple of things. We know he was God at, con even at conception. We know he was God because even as a baby, he received worship. Amen. And there are a couple of verses that point that out. I didn't write it on the, the slide, but there are a couple of verses that point the fact that Jesus received worship. Luke chapter 2, verse 13 to 14. And suddenly there was an angel, the multi of heaven host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Good peace, good will toward men. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 33, talk about the fact that they, they came and they worshipped him. Luke chapter 2, 36 to 38, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phineuel, the tribe of Asher, and she was a great age, and had lived with a husband seven years for, from her virginity, and she was a widow. I talk about that. She came in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake unto him all the things that look for redemption in Jerusalem. So we look at it, Matthew 2, 11 says, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasure, they presented to him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So the scriptures clearly show you that even at his early stage, he was worshipped. Why was all of this done? Because Jesus was really God. Great is the mystery of godliness. The absolute oneness of God is no mystery. It is clearly stated throughout scripture. We saw that earlier. The mystery is not about the absolute oneness of God, you know. The mystery is the fact that the one God came into flesh. So the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16 that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. As I said before, the mystery is not, the absolute oneness of God is not where the mystery lies. Because all through scripture, we started by reading verses that show us that He's one. He's one. He's one. That's not the mystery. The mystery is that God came into flesh. So God was manifest in the flesh. Who? God was manifest in the flesh. Who? God was manifest in the flesh. God was justified in the spirit. God was seen of angels. And it is believed by many theologians. And when the verse says he was seen of angels here, this is the first time that angels were beholding the face of God. Through Jesus Christ. God is omnipresent. As a matter of fact, the cherubims and the seraphims in Isaiah chapter 6, when he described the seraphims in God's presence, they cover their face. They can't behold God. No being in heaven can behold him. But the angels were just looking. So the Bible says, seen of angels for the first time, preach unto the Gentiles, believe on in the world, receive up with the glory. God did all of this. Now, Jesus is really the Father incarnate. And, and, I, and I've used the term incarnate a couple of times without even defining it. So, let me define it for the sake of everybody that's listening. The word incarnate comes from the Latin word incarnato, which means to make flesh. So, we talk about it in the case of Scripture. Amen. Jesus is Christ, our God, who had put on flesh. He was fully God. He was fully human. Amen. So the Bible says that without consciousness, the greatest image of God is God was manifest in the flesh. That speaks to the incarnation. But the Bible also teaches a couple other things in relation to the fact that Jesus put on flesh. Amen. Now let's look at one particular verse. In Revelation Better yet, look at St. John chapter 14, verse 6 to 11. St. John chapter 14, verse 6 to 11. We're just pulling out one of the verses. Just to show that he is his father incarnate. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. Better yet, you sent unto I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Not the verse after that. Verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffice us. In other words, Jesus is talking about the Father. At this point in time, they said, God, all right, Jesus may ask power for a good while now. Now tell me who really is the Father. Jesus answered him. Verse 9. Have I been so long time with you? What was the question he asked? Show us who? The Father. You know, said, show me the Son. Show me the Father. He said, have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? If you had seen me, you had seen the Father. And how says thou then show us the Father? You know why? Because Jesus is really the God of the Old Testament who had put on flesh. We can move. Where it says, I will talk, continue the point that Jesus is, is, the, is the Father incarnate. Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Instead of I am the Father, because he was both the Father and the Son, both visible and invisible, he was saying, I and my Father are one. So the flesh, the spirit, there, there is showing that there's a connection between them. But it's just one and the same. Jesus said, I am in the Father, because unlike any other man, his humanity was inseparably united and joined with the Spirit by the incarnation. That's why he could have made those comments. So scriptures attribute many unique acts both to the Father and to the Jesus. And, and, and why it does that is because Jesus really is the Father. Reason, rising Christ's body, sending up the Comforter, joining people to God, raising believers for death, answering prayer, sanctifying believers. All of these things were said of the Father, but all of these things were also said of Jesus Christ himself. So, the Bible teaches that, amen, that, look at, let, let's look at some verses. Let's try to put some things. I'll show you how they link to the two. So, in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, the voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. What did I say about the capital L-O-R-D? You see, I'm pausing at these points because I want you to see them. The word Lord there is the tetragrammaton. Y-H-W-H. Prepare the way of Jehovah. Make straight his desert a highway for our God. Mm. Now, does the scripture say anything like that in relation to Jesus? Uh, let's look at some more verses before we go along. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 5. Look at the verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. So, if you look for the verse... It's talking about the same. It's same Isaiah chapter 40. So it's coming down. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord. Hello, already has spoken it. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 23. And then we're going to try to link it back to Jesus. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 23. It says, I have sworn... By myself. The word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Now look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. Let's go back to that verse because we have read that earlier. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. 
<laughs> when you look at it, this verse was talking about Jesus Christ. But yet the scripture in Isaiah chapter 40 says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. In other words, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. So scriptures give many unique titles for Jehovah to Jesus. So as Jesus is called the Almighty, Jesus is called the Rock, Jesus is called the Horn of our Salvation, Jesus is called the Shepherd, Jesus is called the Light, Jesus is called the Savior, Jesus is called the Lord, He's called the Holy One, He's called the Judge, He's called the First and the Last. And, and I challenge you, saints, to go look up these verses, because, I mean, we're almost gone two hours now. Amen. And, and, and normally, I would finish at one and a half hour. So I'm really over one and a half hour. But at the same point, we have very few slides left. And I'm giving you homework. Look up in the Old Testament where the Bible called Jehovah these things. And look if you don't find that all of these things are referred back to Jesus. He's the first and the last. He's the king of Israel. He's the creator. He's the redeemer. Jesus said, Jesus even made the point that he is the I am. And I want to look at that one. St. John 8, 56 to 69. Let's look at that one. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Now Abraham, brothers and sisters, was about 4,000 years before this. And Jesus is saying, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Now they, they ask the question, continue verse 57. They ask him a question now. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art, only yet, thou art not yet 50 years old. And has thou seen Abraham? So they say, Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced with some day. Uh, Abraham some day and he rejoiced, him happy. And the Jews them confused. You just born 30 years ago. Abraham is 4,000 years ago. You are telling me that Abraham see you? Look at verse 58. Then Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now they are very familiar with anybody who call himself I am. Look what the Bible says in verse 49, 59. And they took up stones to, to stone him to cast at him. And Jesus hid himself in the way of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. You know why they took up stones to stone him? Because they said that he committed blasphemy. You know, when you come in blasphemy to an Israelite, is when you call yourself God. I'm going to answer one more question before we close. Last week, I saw in the chat where somebody was asking, how is it that we are saying that Jesus is God when Jesus was never on the throne? God was on the throne. Hey. First of all, the Bible described that there was only one on the throne. Revelation chapter 4 verse 2 says, And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, there was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Then Isaiah chapter 4 verse 8 says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Amen. Look at this now. It's an identical description to Jesus. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 78. Behold, he come with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they shall pierce him, and all the kings of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, said the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. Amen. I should go to the, 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 the whole thing about the, the seat. Verse 11 says, Then said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, which was which thou seest right in that book. Verse 17 to 18. Verse 17 to 18. Says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. No. Let me just start here. Remember, you know, the scriptures that we read at the beginning. When Jehovah was talking, he made reference to himself as the first and the last. 
Now, what did the Bible say about who was in the midst of the throne? Remember, you know, when John got the revelation, he saw one in the midst of the throne. Now, who is that one in the middle of the throne? Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. And I beheld, Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. It says, and I beheld a low in the midst of the throne. First of all, another point I want to make. Not only did he re realize that there was one on the throne, he also realized that there was only one throne. I forgot to emphasize that. There was one throne, and there was one that sat on the throne. Now, verse 5 to 6, and behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth in all the earth. Notice the lamb, as it had been slain, which depicts Jesus Christ. It had seven horns, because it had all power. Horn in scripture is symbolic of power, but it has seven eyes because it's omniscient. He sees all things, he knows all things. And the seven eyes represent the seven spirits that sent forth in all the earth. Which Revelation chapter 7 and verse seven, um, 17 says. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 17. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. Now who is the lamb? St. John 1, 29. Behold the lamb of God, which is Jesus, which taketh away the sin of the world. I'm coming down. So God and the lamb, praise God, is one person seated on one throne. He has one name and one face. Only Jesus is both God and lamb. Only Jesus is both deity and humanity. Only Jesus is both sovereign and the sacrifice for sin. The name of Jesus is the supreme name. And the face of Jesus is the visible, the visible image of the invisible God. That's how we know that Jesus is God. And I'm going to close with one prophecy from Isaiah. Remember, we say everywhere in the Old Testament where uh, the name, where salvation is used, is actually the word uh, Yeshua. Yeshua. It says, And in that day thou shalt say, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Behold, God is my Yeshua. <laughs> God is my Jesus. Because that's what Yeshua translates down into Jesus. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my Jesus. Therefore with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of Jesus. How do you know that? John 4, 14. And whosoever drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water. Springing up into everlasting life. St. John 7, 37 to 38. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Revelation 22, 17. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hear it come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him drink of the water of life freely. What we can drink, from the well of salvation, what we are drinking from is Jesus Christ himself. Behold, God has become my Jesus. I will not trust and be afraid for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my son. He also is become my Jesus. Praise God. You know, tonight yeah, we have covered a lot in relation to the oneness of God. And I know some of the stuff we're probably going to have to watch it again and try to make our own notes because a lot was covered. Amen. And normally we would cover some of these things in probably two or three sessions. But the good thing about this season is that God has given us YouTube. Thank God for that. We can go back. We can slow it down. We can make our notes. We can go through as fast as we can. Slow. We can whatever we need to do. But what is important from the lesson tonight 
is that we get a revelation of who Jesus is. He is the God of the Old Testament. Amen. Amen. He, he, he is the fulfillment, the full revelation. Amen. Of who God is. Amen. The Bible at no point teaches a trinity. And if you're an apostolic, you don't need to be, feel intimidated by anybody else. The church at no point in time taught anything else. Amen. In the first century, in relation to no trinity and theology, it was developed after 400 years. But what it taught was the same strict monotheism religion that came out of the Old Testament. That Jesus is God, manifest in flesh. Tonight I pray God that we were blessed by the Bible study. And I pray God that, that we have learned something. Amen. And that we will continue to study the word. Continue to be in the word. Continue to contend for the faith. There are other topics we're going to cover. The aim for this year is to ensure that as a body, we are very familiar with these tenets. The tenets of holiness. The tenets of the oneness of God. The tenets of, why, of, of the salvation plan. Amen. All of these things that are very important and, and need to be re-emphasized and, and, and we need to know them. Some of them you know these things already, but some of us are just learning for the first time. It doesn't matter because our aim is to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. God bless you. Bow your heads as I pray. Great God, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you, Lord, God, for Bible study. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we know who you are. You, as you said to Philip, have we been so long time with you and we have not known you well god we we thank god tonight that we know that you are god manifest in the flesh god as i pray god for every person that heard this bible study tonight i pray god that we'll make our notes i pray god that we will we will go back to every verse that was read we will make a note of them because very important that we get an understanding of who jesus is everybody ought to know who Jesus is. I pray God will bless every unsaved that's on the session tonight. Every person that come to inquire about the oneness of God. And I pray God that at the end of this session that somebody's heart will be open to know that this is you alone who sits on the throne. God, there was so much to be exalted, to be taught, touched in relation to this topic. But I pray God that, that what we have done tonight will be sufficient that somebody will realize that you are God. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament manifesting the flesh. God bless everybody right now in the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. You know, by way of announcement, we have service over the weekend. Amen. On Sunday, let us pray much for the service. Amen. And we must announce also the passing of uh, one of Salwarts, would say, Amen. Somebody that I myself have learned from over the years. Um, Reverend Victor Dows, he passed, I think, yesterday or the day before. Um, it was Sunday. He passed on Sunday. Amen. But the Bible says, the good thing is that we don't sorrow like them that don't have hope. Amen. And it seems as if God is calling people home. But first, to get ourselves ready and so that we'll be able to meet him. We don't have to cry, but we, what we can do, we can uh, pray much for the family. Because as from a human perspective, you're going to miss, amen, our goodly brother. But we will see him again. You just need to live right so that we can see him. So we keep the family in prayer, amen, the those family in the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus, amen. So pray much for the services this week. God bless you or on Sunday. God bless you in Jesus' name. God bless you in Jesus' name.